Welcome everybody in whatever time zone you're viewing this with. We're delighted that you can join together with our three partners this afternoon. Beck Education Centre in Haifa, the Wiener Holocaust Museum in London and the UK Association of Jewish Refugees. And we're delighted that, well, my synagogue, the Ark Synagogue, is hosting this online activity today. We're based in London and uh, we're delighted that everybody can join us. Please do add into the chat where you're watching from, uh, where you're taking part from, and also make sure that when we get into the main part of this programme that you ask lots of questions. During and especially at the end of the programme, there will be an exclusive discount code which is made available to you to purchase Michael's book, that is a new biography of Rabbi Leo Beck from a UK supplier. So please do look out for that, and I'm sure that you'll be able to work out how to copy and paste it into your browser. There's also the opportunity to show your appreciation as well for this event um, by making donations, uh, which will be going to projects run through the Leo Beck Center in Haifa and the Wiener Library, uh, projects which are very much in line with Rabbi Leo Beck's values. It's not surprising that a number of organizations have uh, taken his name um, for themselves. It is his values and his legacy for our time which is so important. Your donations will go to projects which will support that, of which I'll say a little bit more later on, and you'll see a space where you'll be able to donate. Before we get into the main programmes, just a quick word from two of our partners, the Association of Jewish Refugees and the Wiener Library. Hello, my name is Michael Newman. I'm the Chief Executive of the Association of Jewish Refugees, the AJR, and it's a great pleasure to be sponsoring and supporting today's event. The Association of Jewish Refugees was founded in 1941, so this is our special 80th anniversary year. And since our founding, we've continuously provided social and welfare support to that refugee community. Although we no longer operate an employment centre, we do provide social and welfare services to any refugee who came from Nazi oppression uh, wherever they live in Britain. We also disperse grants we receive primarily from the Claims Conference, but also from other projects and governments and programmes. At the heart of what we are, though, is a membership organisation. And so we provide uh, critical socialisation programmes for our members to main contact, which is especially important at the moment through the pandemic. As that first generation dwindles, we also are connecting uh, to the second generation so that they too can play a role in preserving the link with their family heritage. And we're also the country's leading benefactor of Holocaust educational projects and programmes, as well as sponsoring our own resources, primarily our testimony collections, AJR Refugee Voices, and AJR My Story. Wishing everybody well for a successful event today. Thank you. The library is Britain's largest and the world's oldest collection of material about the Nazi era and the Holocaust. It started with the work of Dr. Alfred Wiener, who was a German Jewish refugee from Berlin. The library contains a huge range of different kinds of evidence of the Holocaust, including photographs, books, documents, posters. The library's mission has been to preserve the legacy of the documentation of the Holocaust, but also the lives of its survivors. When you go and visit the stores of the library, you can feel the hopes of that generation almost stacked high on the shelves of the archives, the hope for a better future. And that is a tremendous gift, but it's also a tremendous responsibility for all of us. I'm fortunate to be the UK Chair of the Friends of uh, Leah Beck Education Centre in Haifa. Taking the name of Leah Beck is not one that one does lightly. And the values really bear out in everything that the centre does. It's a whole campus. There's uh, synagogues there. There's uh, um, um, play schools and uh, uh, programmes, high school, junior school, and then many communal projects as well, ones which work out in the community. And as many of you all know, Haifa is an incredibly multicultural city. 
one which a lot of progressive Jews in particular will be delighted to support and we think really are um, living out the values of Rabbi Leo Beck. Already we've seen people uh, commenting from all around the world, from Dublin, from Gothenburg, from uh, the South Coast, all over the UK and further. We're delighted that you're all joining us today uh, to learn more about Rabbi Leo Beck, um, to hear about how you can input and make sure that uh, Rabbi Leo Beck's values and ethic comes out into society and especially into the state of Israel. It's my honor to introduce uh, Lord Daniel Finkelstein um, to you, um, who's going to be interviewing Michael Mayer, the author today, um, as well as being an incredible commentator on politics and, uh, and society. Uh, he is also just a darn good bloke. And I think that's going to come out today. This is why we wanted uh, Daniel to be interviewing today. We think you're really going to enjoy today. Uh, learn a lot, hopefully donate a little bit as well, but think that this has been the best hour of this Sunday that you have spent. Well, Rabbi Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, it's wonderful to have an opportunity to uh, to do this event. Uh, I'm looking forward to talking to Michael very much, and uh, hopefully he'll be on screen any second. Here he is. Uh, Michael, can I begin um, by offering my congratulations to you? Because obviously, while preparing for this, I had an early opportunity to read your book, and it really is an amazing work, not just of scholarship, which I, you know, which I think everyone is aware you're capable of, but also uh, of capturing the spirit of an individual and an age. Um, and I do recommend this book very strongly to, to everyone who's listening uh, today. So congratulations uh, to begin with. And I suppose we ought to start with the, this question. What What is it that made you do this? What, what made you do this subject? You've written a lot of other books. Um, you must have chosen a moment, quite a big undertaking. Well, first of all, thank you very much for participating in this, uh, Lord Finkelstein, or Daniel, as you've asked me to call you. Um, I think this all relates very much to my own origins. Uh, like Rabbi Leo Beck, I was living, albeit as a very small child, in Berlin during the 1930s, in fact, until 1941, when we were fortunate to be able to leave and come to the United States. Um, in 1938, the Nazi government insisted that Jews all take a Jewish name in addition to their uh, given name. Uh, rabbi Leo Beck became Rabbi Leo Israel Beck, and I became not Mishael Meyer, but Mishael Israel Meyer. We had that in common. My parents certainly knew Rabbi Beck, and I felt that here was an individual about whom I had heard, with whom I had a, a connection in terms of my earliest childhood, even though I may not have been fully aware of it, and I was interested, therefore, in pursuing the career of Leo Beck, not only out of an interest as a historian, but also out of an interest in understanding myself and my own background. I began to write on Leo Beck very early, more than 50 years ago. I was a graduate student at the Hebrew Union College and the editor of Judaism magazine, uh, Rabbi uh, Schwarzschild, uh, asked that I translate into English for his journal one of the most important essays of Leo Beck, and that is his essay, Theologie und Geschichte, Theology and History. One learns very well the content of something when one has to translate it. And it stuck with me. It stuck with me because in that essay, Beck was able to connect history with religion, with theology. He made an argument which has been important for my own theology through all these years. The notion that revelation 
is something that involves the moral in man. As Beck put it in that essay, it was the incursion of the infinite into the finite and the tension in the human moral fiber that results. In other words, it is Beck's belief and my belief that God enters human history, enters the human conscience as a religious imperative. And so I have ever since that translation uh, been interested in Leo Beck on the 10th anniversary of his, of his yard site, he, he, he died in 1956, it was 1966, I wrote my first article on Leo Beck, and I have written on him uh, often since then. And this book kind of represents my putting it all together to try to understand in one volume, both the thinker, and I think he has been undervalued as a religious thinker, one thinks of Martin Buber, one thinks of uh, Franz Rosenzweig, of Hermann Cohn, and all too little of Leo Beck. But the really amazing thing about Beck, I found, is that there was no hiatus between his thought and his personality. He really lived what he believed. And that is something that is so rare and so admirable. And that certainly drew me to Rabbi Leo Beck. And I made a point of calling the book Rabbi Leo Beck, because all too often that rabbi is left off. And I think one does not understand Leo Beck unless one understands him not only as scholar, not only as thinker, but also and maybe most fundamentally as rabbi. Well, yes, I, 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 I saw that uh, running through the book. Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about the craft, because people will be interested. You know, how long did, it, did, did this piece of work take you? I mean, you, you basically said your whole life is one of the answers to that question. But once you decided to embark on this as a biography, uh, tell us a bit about, how, you know, the sources you consulted, sure. how you managed to put together, so that you could be sure that you'd covered the waterfront of his, yes. uh, of his <laughs> thinking. Uh, I think I began working on the book about five years ago. Um, what sources did I use? Well, I had the um, advantage of being asked by the late Rabbi Albert Friedlander, who certainly is a name known there in the UK, um, to participate in an edition of Leo Beck's works, a six volume edition in which as many as possible of Beck's writings would be included in their original language, whether in German uh, or in English. And I was asked to do the sixth volume. The sixth volume is the one that contains essays uh, and letters and speeches. Um, in the process of uh, putting that volume together, I interviewed various people including Rabbi Leo Beck's granddaughter, Mariana, who just died a few months ago, um, and uh, also others who knew him, gathered all these letters together. And I have drawn upon them, uh, as well as uh, the major works of Rabbi Leo Beck, The Essence of Judaism, This People Israel, uh, his various uh, uh, articles that he wrote in scholarly periodicals. And I have supplemented that uh, with archival materials, um, particularly uh, the collection at the Leo Beck Institute in New York, but also the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and a couple of archives uh, in Israel and in uh, uh and in Germany. So those that was those were the sources uh, that I have used for this volume. Thank you. Let, let's uh, let's dive into some of the ideas in the book. And quite early on, you talk about um, Rabbi Leo Becker's being a Kantian, although he was uh, 
interested also in Spinoza. And when when an ordinary reader reads that, uh, you know, the Kantian imperative always seems to me to uh, to be to forget what I read last time I read about Kant. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about what that really meant? It ran through his judicial philosophy, but most people will read it and think, well, I'm not sure I know what that means. Okay. Um Leo Beck wrote his uh, doctoral dissertation on Spinoza's influence in Germany, but he was never a Spinozist. And I think the reason for that is quite clear, not only for him, but for Jews in general, because Spinoza's system, Deus sive natura, that, that God is basically nature, it is a deterministic system that Spinoza set out, which leaves little room for a religious imperative for individual choice. And particularly for liberal and reformed Jews for whom ethics is at the very heart of their Judaism, Spinoza represents a, a, a philosophy that is not very easy to reconcile uh, particularly with the kind of Judaism that Beck stressed, namely prophetic Judaism, the Judaism of conscience, the Judaism of individual choice. Kant is a different story. Beck, like so many Jewish thinkers from Kant's time on down to the present, was very much influenced by Kant, whom he regarded as far closer to Judaism as Beck understood it, than the born Jew Spinoza. Um, and so Beck was attracted to Kant and particularly through Kant's uh, Jewish uh, disciple many years later, uh, Hermann Cohen. Uh, Kant uh, was uh, a person that, uh, have represented a personality, Beck said, that he particularly admired. He admired Kant's emphasis upon motivation uh, in making ethical decisions. Um, Hermann Cohen was never his immediate teacher because uh, uh, Hermann Cohen was not yet in Berlin when Beck was studying in Berlin. Uh, but later, when he came to Berlin in 1912, he must have encountered Hermann Cohn uh, at that time. In fact, it is famously said that when Hermann Cohen was passing away from this world, when he was dying, and one of his disciples says, what shall we do without you? Hermann Cohn famously replied, but you will still have Rabbi Leo Beck. In other words, uh, not only did Beck regard Cohen as his teacher, but Cohen regarded, in a sense, Beck as his successor. Um, which is not to say that Beck can be simply defined as a neo-Kantian. There were other influences on Beck, and one of the most important influences was his teacher at the University of Berlin, Wilhelm Diltai. Wilhelm Diltai was not a systematic philosopher. Wilhelm Diltai was a historian, uh, a bit of a psychologist. And he gave Beck something which was important for Beck's work as a scholar, as well, I believe, for Beck's work as a rabbi. Because Diltai, above all, stressed two things. One was mitfühlen, um, literally feeling with, but we would probably say in English, empathy. Um, that empathy was important for Beck in understanding historical characters. It was important for him also in dealing as a pastor with people in distress. He was amazingly able to empathize with those to whom he spoke, whether as scholar or whether as pastor. And Diltai also stressed Verstehen. Verstehen understanding involved something more than knowing. It meant if you were dealing with a historical character, you had to try to understand the context, the personality of the person that you were writing about. And Beck was able to do that when he wrote about the prophets, for example. 
The prophets were more important to Beck than anything else in the Jewish tradition. Uh, and Beck was able uh, to understand them from within as he sought to understand Judaism from within. It's interesting, as I point out in the book, that he does not write usually Wissenschaft des Judentums, in other words, the academic study of Judaism, but rather Wissenschaft, des Juden, Wissenschaft vom Judentum, that is to say, the study of Judaism from within Judaism. Beck is not a writer from the outside. He is not an an analyst who stands outside the tradition. He tries to write about Judaism from within the tradition, and while at the same time maintaining the high criteria of scholarship. And that, I think, is another of the amazing achievements of Leo Beck. Yes. Um, one of the most attractive things to me anyway about Leo Beck, and it came out very clearly in her book, uh, is his believing in, in Jewish solidarity and the tolerance of multiple strands of Judaism. And from a very early, very young age, he stands out quite bravely, even when he's supporting strands of Judaism, uh, their right to express themselves, despite the fact that he doesn't agree with them. Um, which is which is a remarkable thing for a young person, particularly to comprehend. But this is a, a very relevant um, and important part of his thinking. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about that. Sure, I, I think Leo Beck was what you might call a Claudius Railnik. He was someone who believed very much in what uh, Solomon Schechter called the the. Catholic Israel, Catholic with a small c. In other words, an all-inclusive uh, Israel. Um, and he manifested this already very early in his career. When he was a rabbi in the town of Oppeln, uh, just uh, a couple of years out of seminary, he attended a meeting of uh, the General uh, Association of German Rabbis. And there he suggested that a rabbinical education should not be limited to a single seminary. He himself had studied both at the seminary of the what we may call the conservative uh, movement uh, in Germany of Zacharia Frankel um, in Breslau, but then he went to study at the Hochschule für die Wissenschaft des Judentums, which was a liberal seminary in Berlin. And while in Berlin, he also uh, studied, it's not quite clear, either at the Orthodox seminary or at a yeshiva in Berlin. He believed that what was important in self-definition of a Jew was not the adjective liberal or conservative or orthodox, but the noun Judaism. And he stressed this again and again. Um, and that's what made him persona grata so much across the religious spectrum. With the exception of the most orthodox, they all had faith in Beck because he knew that Beck was sympathetic to them. And this is interesting because Beck was at the same time very much a liberal Jew, liberal in the German sense, which is um, more like reform in, in the UK. Um, Beck, as a, uh, as a liberal Jew, was very much involved with the World Union for Progressive Judaism, uh, which, of course, was founded in 1926 in London by Lily Montague and Claude Montefiore. He himself became the president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism upon Montefiore's death in 1937. But he was very much against the kind of party politics that took place in Germany, where you had elections for the community council and you were either a member of the Liberal Party or you were a member of the Orthodox Party or you were a member of the Zionist Party. He uh, didn't like that uh, at all. He believed very much that Jews should have respect for one another, regardless of their denomination, regardless of whether they were Zionists or non-Zionists. And that was uh, that ability 
Um, and that uh, conviction, I think, made it possible later in the difficult Nazi years uh, to be chosen as the leader of German Jewry uh, in these those very dark times. Well, let, let me pull out a, a couple of themes of that. Though one of them is a it's, it's a personal interest to me. I recall uh, attending a friend's mother's uh, shiva, and uh, he was from the United Synagogue. So obviously, it was a United Synagogue rabbi who was doing it. And I noticed as the prayers began that my wife had to stand at the back, and I was standing at the front. And I found that quite offensive, that whole idea. On the other hand, it was my friend's mother's uh, funeral. It wasn't a uh, shiver. It wasn't the time to make a political point. But I, I worried about it afterwards as well. You know, um, was I in showing respect uh, for his religion, showing disrespect to women? Uh, it's a very difficult balance. And you have to, you're always uh, um, having this problem. So, Let's investigate what Beck did in a similar situation. The 1929 Berlin synagogues being built. Um, there's a discussion: should it have separate seating or not? Uh, there's a row in the community, and he supports a third way compromise. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and also, you know, what your feelings are about whether whether his compromise position lets you down in those circumstances? Because I worry about that constantly myself. Let me broaden that, Daniel, to talk about Beck and women in, in general and bring that in as well. Um, Beck married a very beautiful woman uh, named Natalie uh, while he was rabbi in Oppel. She was supposedly the most beautiful woman in town. And she became a wonderful Rebbitzin. She played that role, a subordinate role to be sure, uh, very happily as far as we know. She never went to university. Uh, which was not common for women at that time. But Beck was, in a way, a feminist. He believed that there was a great revolution going on with regard to women uh, in Germany in general. He sent his daughter, his only child, Ruth, to university. Um, and he was a great proponent of the... Uh, uh, Jüdische uh, Frauenbund, the uh, women's organization of the Jews in Germany. He had uh, close relationships later on in the Nazi years with the many very devoted women who helped him in social welfare activities during the Nazi times, in particular Hannah Karminski. Now, when they built the new synagogue in Berlin, the on Prince Regentenstrasse, I think it was 1932 that it was completed just before the Nazi period. It was the last synagogue that they were able to build. The question became, should it have mixed seating, which had been common in uh, reform and conservative Judaism in the United States for some time. Uh, various rabbis were supposed to issue uh, that is to say, they were supposed to issue briefs as to what it is that should be done. The Orthodox said maintain separate seating. Uh, one or two of the liberal rabbis said no, there should be uh, <coughs> men and women should sit together. Um, Beck took a, little, a middle position. He suggested that men and women who sought to sit together should be allowed to sit together. And uh, those who, however, preferred not to, whether they were men or women, sh there should be room in the synagogue for them to sit separately. Uh, and when the question was posed later with regard to post-World War II German Jewry, he kept the same opinion. But when he was lecturing in London after the war, where he would occasionally be more personal, he related a, a personal experience, and Beck did not often relate personal experiences. He said that when his wife, who passed away in 1937, Natalie, was already very ill, and Beck was no longer officiating at services, uh, at various synagogues. He was much too involved with the leadership of the community as a whole. At that time, he personally chose to sit with his wife uh, in the synagogue. And he said, 
that meant a great deal to him. Maybe one other thing about Beck and women, and that is Beck believed that even as women should not try, or that, let me put it this way, that it was a mistake on the part of German Jews to try to assimilate to the non-Jews in terms of their manners, in terms of their custom, in terms of their identity, and at the loss of their Jewish identity. He said the same thing was true with regard to women, that women, Jewish women, should not seek to be like other women in terms of their values. They should not assimilate to a culture about which he was very ambivalent, namely um, the culture of Weimar with its loose sexuality. Instead, Jewish women should become women who are proud of their Jewish identity and within that identity should indeed make sure that they are subjects and not objects. He very much believed that women should not be the objects of their husbands, but they should both be subjects. And finally, uh, as uh, you may know, uh, Beck did sign the rabbinical diploma of the first woman rabbi, Regina Jonas, uh, when it was asked, when apparently the authorities asked for a copy of the smicha, of the certificate of ordination, Beck signed uh, that certificate and he regarded uh, Regina Jonas highly. So Beck was favorably inclined to women, but with regard to the synagogue issue, he was also concerned with the sensibilities of everyone, including those who believed there should be mixed seating, but also one shouldn't offend those who had grown up with separate seating and for whom forcing them into mixed seating might have made it more difficult for them to concentrate on their prayers. Thank you. I, 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 my ears pricked up when I, I well, my eyes, but I don't know how the, how to disc, what metaphor to use, but when I, I was very interested to notice in your book, uh, his relationship with Gershon Sholem and that they were, uh, there was a relationship of respect and affection uh, there because Sholem was um, quite antipathetic to the kind of liberal nationalist uh, strand of German Jewry to which I perceive Beck as belonging, but you can correct that if you think that's not right. Um, and actually even felt a bit smug that he had left um, to Israel when other people had, had, had stayed uh, behind. Um, and um, can you tell us, so in the book, the recent book on the Sholem, on the Sholems, the, on, the, on all the siblings, they, 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 were, they all represent different strands of Judaism, mm -hmm. the communist international mm -hmm. strand, right. the, the German Jewish liberal nationalists, the Zionists, and then the kind of more purist Orthodox Jews. How did um, you, you talked a little bit about how Beck was kind of ecumenical between those, but where, what was his own strand? Uh, okay. And what did he think in particular of the Zionist movement? Uh, let me say first that uh, Leo Beck and Gershom Sholem uh, were good friends. Uh, when Beck would visit Israel, uh, he, would, uh, he was invited to the Sholems regularly and uh, sent a, spent a Pesach Seder in the Sholem home. And he was also sympathetic to the binationalism represented by Brit Shalom, of which Sholem was a part, uh, favoring a state that included uh, Jews and Arabs in a single state. But when the state was established, he then, and from then on, favored what we today call a two-state solution. But let me go back uh, earlier. Um, Beck did not join uh, the uh, Zionist party uh, in Germany. He was not a political Zionist, um, but he was in favor of the establishment of settlements in Eretz Israel, in the land of Israel. He was a member of the pro-Palestine committee and in 1929, uh, he became a member of the non-Zionist wing of the Jewish agency. 
So he very much involved himself in Zionism, while at the same time, he was also a member of the Zentralverein, uh, the central organization of German citizens of the uh, Jewish faith. In the course of time, he became more and more dedicated to Zionism. One of the things that really surprised me was that as early as 1925, uh, he gave a speech in Königsberg in which he said to uh, these Jews who felt very much German, you know, one day we may have to leave Germany. And he called up the experience of Spanish Jewry, which in the Middle Ages had been so much a part of their intellectual environment and cultural environment, who in 1492 uh, were expelled suggesting that one day we may need a country of our own. Beck was, however, very much on the, uh, shall I say, dovish side as far as Israel was concerned. Another thing that I discovered, which is not generally known, is that when he was living in London in uh, the immediate post-war period, he came together with Norman Bentwich, who had been an attorney general of the mandate regime in Palestine, later professor at the Hebrew University, and Victor Golands, a uh, very liberal left-wing publisher in England. And together they formed a society, which also uh, Albert Einstein joined, to provide relief for Jews and Arabs who had suffered during the fighting in Palestine in 1947. So Beck was someone who believed, particularly after the war, how important it was to think not in terms of state, but in terms of, on the one hand, the individual, and on the other hand, humanity. It's interesting that in World War I, he served as a chaplain. He, in World War I, was certainly a proponent of the German cause, as was just about all of the German Jews, including Martin Buber, though not Gershom Scholem and not Gershom Scholem's brother. Um, after the war, he became a member of a Jewish peace society. He was a pacifist during the 1920s, active in that organization until the Nazis, not surprisingly, made it close down in 1933. He believed that the return of Jews to Palestine, to the land of Israel, was providential. And he visited it there, not only in 1935 with his wife, but later uh, he lectured in Israel um, and he visited the kibbutzim where uh, there was a large number of German Jews. He uh, visited people there that he knew and he admired the kibbutzim because he saw the kibbutzim as a just society. He saw it as a, as a form of religious socialism which he had a great deal of respect for. So um, I would say if we talk about Beck and Zionism, one would have to say that Beck became a very strong cultural Zionist. And in the 30s, as he saw the need for, um, for getting Jews out of Germany as soon as possible, as the situation got worse and worse, he became more and more attached not only to the cultural project, but also to the project of settling Jews in the land of Israel where they might be safe uh, and very much critical of the British government for putting such severe limits upon Jewish emigration to the land of Israel. Okay, um, let, me, let me move to a slightly different later period of his life, but very critical obviously to his reputation. And that is his way, his way of dealing with the Second World War when it, when it arrives, or at least of, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, 
what we might call the high period of the Nazis, right, where uh, that domination was hard to avoid and a lot of other people had fled and people were being killed. So uh, there, there are some, you know, some people, David Cohen is an example of that in Amsterdam, after the war was severely criticised for attempting to run uh, Jewish affairs under those circumstances, that it was almost tantamount to collaboration uh, to do that. And at the very least was incredibly naive. What What is your assessment of of Beck's war, really, before he goes to Theresienstadt? Yeah, uh, it is interesting that uh, Beck was chosen to be the head of the Reichsvertretung uh, der Deutschen Juden, the, the representation of the Jews to uh, the government. Um, it is remarkable that he was chosen because uh, that kind of leadership had usually been in the hands of non-rabbis. And there were those who criticized him uh, for, or criticized the notion that a rabbi should be the head of the community. And yet it turned out to be very important because what Beck did uh, in running during the Reichsvertretung, a democratic organization in the midst of an autocratic government. It was extraordinary. You had a dictatorship running the country, but within the Jewish community, there was democracy. Beck saw it as his task to maintain morale, and he did that amazingly. Well known is the 1935 um, message that he sent out to all of the Jewish communities at the time of Yom Kippur in which five times he said, we Jews stand before God. We owe our loyalty to God. Uh, that puts us above the state, above the lies that are propagated against us. That was something that few others could do the way that Beck did. But that meant also that he, as the 30s wore on, and after Kristallnacht, after the pogroms of November 9th, 1938, the Reichsvertretung was put an end to, the democratic nature of Jewish self-government was ended, and a new organization called the Reichsvereinigung was put into place, which was under Gestapo control. Should Beck then, who continued as leader, have said, I'm not doing this, or should he have continued knowing that if the Nazis controlled the Jewish community directly, measures would be even more severe than they were? Having a Jewish leader like Leo Beck, who was arrested five times, made it possible for this rabbi to go to, when he was called, to Nazi officials and absolutely contradict the stereotype of the plaintive Jew to stand there with great dignity and do whatever needed to be done to the extent that it could be done. There's a famous story, which I also relate in the book, how on one occasion he was called before uh, the Gestapo and one of the members said, um, one thing you have to admit, Rabbi Beck, and that is that the German people are all behind their Führer. And Beck responded, and Beck had chutzpah too. He responded and said, well, I'll tell you, when I leave here, and this was in 1941, in September of 1941, when Jews were required to wear the star so that everybody knew that that was a Jew. He said, when I leave here and walk down the street, there will be people who come up to me and they will secretly put a bar of chocolate or an apple in one or another pockets of my coat. In this way, making it clear that not all of the German people believed that the Führer had brought salvation to Germany, but there were decisions that had to be made and these decisions became controversial. When the deportations began, from Berlin and other places in, in uh, the fall of 1941, Beck knew that 
there were Jews who were deported and they were being placed in vans uh, where the exhaust pipe led into the van and they were asphyxiated. He did not tell people because there was already a very high rate of suicide and he was fearful that that would only increase the suicide. He had to make a similar decision in der Heresienstadt where he made the same decision. The other question in Berlin was, should the Jews participate in any way in the deportation process? And Beck decided that when the Jews were being picked up, the Nazis had said, either you appoint Jews to participate in that process of delivering the notices and, and um, helping them to leave their home, or we will do it ourselves. And Beck actually asked students at the Hochschule, the liberal seminary where he taught, to participate in that process. Now, one can therefore make a, what I believe is a false accusation of collaboration. It's a false accusation because collaboration involves sympathizing with the individual who asked you to collaborate, which was certainly not the case. And we know from testimony of those who survived that both in Berlin and in Theresienstadt, there were those who said that Beck made the right decision. That in Berlin, when a rabbinical student came, helped them to pack, kept up their morale as much as possible, that that was the right decision to make. In Theresienstadt, there were those who in fact survived. And obviously if they had committed suicide, they would not have survived. But I think the final answer to this is from Pirkei Avot, from the Talmud, where it says, Al tadun et chavercha ad shetagia limkomo. Do not judge your neighbor unless you are in that person's place. Um, my own feeling is that Beck probably made the right decision, but one can make an argument that perhaps he should have made the decision the other way. Ultimately, I think we outsiders have no right to make yeah. a moral condemnation when we were not in that situation ourselves. I agree with you with that very strongly. By the way, the reason I reached behind was, of course, to reach this book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, Hannah Arendt's book, and she makes the criticism. Of his. Was he, was he, um, he makes the criticism that we, she makes the criticism we've just been discussing. Was he um, resilient against such criticisms or deeply wounded by them? Or did he, did, did, you know, how did he feel about them? I, I, I don't know. And, and this brings us really to the psychology of the person. And I do want to say something about this before our time is up. Yes. Beck was a very private individual. He did not easily express feelings. Famously in his first pulpit in Oppel, when he gave his farewell lecture, he said, you will notice that in all of my sermons here, I never used the word I. For Beck, what was important for a rabbi to do was to present a message, not to present himself or herself. And Beck believed that a rabbi should be a bit of an ascetic. And if necessary, if necessary, even a martyr for the cause. There was a tradition in Beck's family that the name Beck really means Ben Kedoshim, <coughs> a son of the holy or a martyr. Beck wrote a good deal about martyrdom. Martyrdom, Kiddush Hashem, is in Judaism regarded as the highest of all mitzvot, to give up your life for the sake of your religion. And so when Beck determined to remain in Germany, he recognized that it might cost him his life, but he also would have seen a religious significance if he had lost his life in the process. Beck was a person of great self-effacement. He, um, he was a man of modesty, which is remarkable for someone 
who had such responsibility, who had so many important offices. He was for a time the president of uh, German B'nai B'rith. He was the president of the Rabbinical Association. He, had, he was president of the World Union for Progressive Judaism. And yet he was not only a private man, but a very modest man. He did not write his name Rabbi Leo Beck, PhD. He simply signed his letters L. Beck. And then famously, as I, as I end the book, he wanted inscribed on his tombstone, simply Mi Geza Rabbanim, from a lineage of rabbis. He prided himself above all of being a teacher. Well, thank you so much. There, there are so many questions, as you know, that I have to put, I want to put you, and I don't have time because I do want to fit in one or two questions from our audience. We haven't got very long, I'm afraid, for doing that. But um, let me just ask, because I think uh, uh, Gorda's 1953, I'm not sure who exactly who that is, but uh, they asked a very good question. Um, what was Beck's experience being into Raisin, and how did this incarceration influence him in his thinking and writing? Well, having been in Theresen, he, of course, suffered along with everyone else. He did have somewhat better accommodations, but um, uh, he was hungry uh, all the time. When he finally got to London after the war, he was emaciated. He had lost 70 pounds uh, at Theresienstadt. He saw himself in Theresienstadt as the rabbi, but also the scholar. He gave lectures, which were attended by as many as 500 people, which raised the morale of, um, of, the, of the inmates in Theresienstadt. It was amazing. There are numerous testimonies about how people would come to them, to, to Leo Beck, and they would sit and talk, and they wouldn't talk about their situation they wouldn't complain about what the situation was like in Theresienstadt. They would instead talk about philosophy, literature, spiritual things. That was the amazing thing about Beck, because he could empathize with people, because he had concern for them. He could raise them above their environment. He would enable Jews, both in Germany and later in Theresienstadt, to transcend their environment, to give them a sense of hope, not idle hope, but hope that despite it all, and Beck loved the German word dennoch, nonetheless, nonetheless one must hope, no matter how severe the conditions may be, if you give up hope, you have lost everything. Okay. And, yeah. I've got, I've got two, I've got, well, the reason I've said those, I've got two, that, that was tremendous, I've got two, I thought you'd finished, I'm sorry, uh, I've got two more, que two, two more questions to ask, um, which we, we've got five minutes uh, in total to, to do. One is um, from David Kirk, how did Beck's pre-rabbinic life impact his teachings? His pre-rabbinic life? Yes. Well, I think where he was born had a great influence on him. He was born in Lissa, in Posen. And uh, that was a small uh, community, but a quite tolerant one. He went to a Comenius uh, high school there, uh, where he learned Latin and Greek. But most importantly, Beck throughout his life had a great appreciation because he came from a small Jewish community uh, of the advantages that such a small community had over the large community. I think he was always felt more at home in a community of small or middle size, and he wrote about this, than he did in the anime of the large city uh, of Berlin. To be sure, he wanted to come to Berlin. He wanted to teach in the liberal seminary. It was a very prestigious position. But he had a nostalgia and a love of the small community where everybody knows each other, where there are good relations between Jews and non-Jews as there were in Lissa. So he always looked back with um, fond memories of the environment from which he came. One should add that Posen, of course, was a province that was sometimes Polish and sometimes Prussian. 
Uh, and Beck had a great understanding then for the East European Jews to whom he catered while he was a chaplain on the Eastern Front in the First World War, and uh, who, of course, um, he was concerned for their welfare uh, in the various cities in which he served as a rabbi. So I think that early um, period of his life was, was influential, as was the fact that his father was a rabbi. Okay, well, we have one, one more question, which the person who's asking it wants that's a name with, with help, but the question's good. It's, it's, it's what you hope the influence of your book will be uh, looking forward. Yes. Um, I hope that my book will influence people, Jews especially, but also non-Jews, to not only learn more about Leo Beck, but learn from him that it is possible to be an individual whom our tradition says, toho kevaro, that his inside is like his outside, which is another way of saying a man of genuine integrity, not only able to integrate the various facets of his career, but able to integrate his belief with his actions. And let me just add one other thing. There are many institutions today that are named after Leo Beck. And what I find interesting is that in various ways, they represent the three aspects of his career, Beck as scholar, Beck as teacher, and Beck as rabbi. Beck as scholar, the Leo Beck Institute in London New York, Jerusalem, his, uh, his career as a teacher, the Leo Beck Center in Haifa, as a teacher also, of course, the Leo Beck College uh, in London, and finally, as a rabbi, the Leo Beck Synagogue in Los Angeles, California. That's the remarkable thing about Beck, that he could be admired not only as a scholar, not only as a thinker, but also as a rabbi. Michael, well, listen, everyone who's listening to this can know from the fluency and insight of, uh, of Michael's uh, contribution, just how good a book this is. Um, there's so much I didn't get around to asking. Uh, but that's because you will have to read the book. Well, okay. thank you, thank, thank you, you very much, Daniel, for being a part of it, and I appreciate mm, your questions, it's a privilege. And comments very much. Rabbi Aaron, you're coming back in now. Thank you. I'm sure that everybody will agree what a privilege it has been to hear the two of you speaking this afternoon, especially Michael. Um, how incredible to be inspired by such an individual as Rabbi Leo Beck. Um, it's, you may not have seen in the comments as well that uh, the way that people have been inspired personally in their lives. Uh, Leslie Michael speaking about when Rabbi Leo Beck uh, delivered the priestly benediction at Aleph Gardens on a Shabbat morning, we felt we were in the presence of a biblical prophet. Um, bringing together those who were influenced by him, uh, thoughts of Rabbi Elk and uh, Rabbi uh, Robert Samuel Zichronam Levracha, founders and uh, uh, rabbis at the Learbeck Education Center in Haifa, and people from South Africa, Reva Foreman of the Temple Israel, Hilbra Johannesburg that donated a Torah scroll uh, to uh, Rabbi uh, Samuels to the Learbeck Center, to the synagogue there. Please now buy the book. Uh, you'll have the discount code uh, popping up any minute now. Uh, please go and buy the book and learn more about how we can all put some of Leo Beck's uh, values into, uh, uh, into our own lives. Um, in particular, thank you so much for giving us those three aspects of being a scholar, a teacher, and a rabbi. Um, I think what very much came through and will influence many of the young people, the students of the Leo Beck Education Centre in Haifa, and the student rabbis of uh, Leo Beck College in London, will be how one might be an empathetic leader, making decisions in the most difficult of circumstances to save as many souls as possible, and in more peaceful times, to inspire to bring people together and create some shalom bayat within our communities. You gave us some incredible uh, uh, messages as well. 
uh, not to judge your neighbour unless you're in that person's place, something we all need a little bit of uh, during these times of pandemic as well, and always to have hope. What a fantastic way for us to spend this Sunday. Please go and buy the book. Please learn about, more about uh, our supporting organisations, the Association of Jewish Refugees, the Vina Library and the Lebec Education Centre in Haifa. Danny, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you.